Did you hear that? I heard recording was in progress. Good. You got it. You're on. Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm Steve Coggin. I'm the president of Mecklenburg Audubon. And thanks for coming to our monthly meeting. Uh, we have two special guests, Nancy Nicholson and Ruth Ann Grissom. But uh, Nancy, you want to wait a few minutes for Ruth Ann to arrive? Um, I haven't heard from her, so I'm not sure if she'll be here or not. Okay. Well, if you want to go ahead and okay. start? I'll be glad to. Um, thank you, Steve. Um, as a few of you know, um, we were, Ruth Ann and I have been co-chairing an effort at Ladder Park for now. We're on our sixth year, putting in um, native plants and um, I'm going to go ahead and put myself on putting in native plants and removing invasive plants, working on trails and erosion. So we've been working really closely with Parks and Rec. Um, and so I'm trying to get also get more money for them. So advocacy for them, but also coordinating with them in terms of what we do. So we um, were offered a few months ago, probably four or five months ago, the possibility of having, the, they are hiring two people out of a Nashville business that comes, they will come into a park and remove invasive plants. And so this is part of um, some money that was given to uh, Parks and Rec through the county commissioners this year, $750,000, which is a lot of money. We've never had anything like that before. We've had 200,000 probably five or six years ago. So anyway, we met with several of you uh, at Ladder Park to talk about that. Um, and our, our main concern was really primarily along the stream. Um, so if we get rid of the privet there, it's going to take away a lot of the evergreen. So we met with you all to talk about that. And what we have, have ended up deciding to do is to postpone the Ladder Park part of it, the main part of Ladder Park, and ask them to work in the area behind St. Patrick's Catholic Church, where I know Audubon folks, we don't tend to bird there so much, but um, I think it could be a much better birding area once we, if we can really get it rehabbed a little bit. It's, it's mostly privet at this point. So, and then we would this year really try to plant some of the blank spaces, especially along the stream, some of our native plants to fill in, and give them a head start before next year. So that's, that's where this has happened really since then, um, since we met with, I think, five of you. And, um, but it is an, a great opportunity that they are offering to us at this point. And so we would like to take advantage of it, but we also will give, this will give us a chance to see the kind of work they do and be sure that we trust them and give us a head start to plant um, some of, particularly evergreen things along the stream bed to help with erosion too. So, um, and we decided that in part to, again, see how it, how, it, how it goes over on the other side of Dilworth Road, but also um, because of COVID, we feel like that may limit our, our volunteer force, although it hasn't so much so far, we just spread out a lot. So we would welcome you all and um, hoping that if you wanna be on my mailing list, if you will let me know that, Nancy E. Nicholson at gmail.com. And um, several of you are already on the mailing list, but we would welcome you to come and work with us and help us in this effort, which we believe, Ruth Ann and I are both bird watchers. We believe in the long run that this is the best plan for birds is to give them native plants for their food source. And again, help helping the environment as well. But I'm happy to take any questions. If anybody has questions about um, kind of our general effort or particularly this possibility um, with Parks and Rec. Do you have some dates for planting? Our, our next work day will be the first Thursday in October. And then um, that's Thursday. And then the very next work day will be the first Saturday in November. Uh, sometimes we have a December work day and sometimes we don't. We probably will this December because we're really wanting to give it a lot of effort to particularly along the stream bed. As, as those of you who come to Ladder Park regularly, you know because of dog use and children, particularly around the playground, that there's some big gaps 
with nothing but erosion at this point. So we're really wanting to focus on those areas primarily. So. Okay, well, thank you, Nancy. We'll put out the word about those Please dates do. for yeah. work in our newsletters and emails. Yeah, and people can volunteer. Typically, we meet the first Thursday of most months. We, we don't do January typically, and we don't do the, I think it's July and August, but otherwise we're typically first Thursdays, um, 10 to 12, but, but the ideal would be for people to be on my mailing list because that's the most up-to-date information. So thanks a lot, Steve. Well, thank you. Yeah. Okay, we have some recent bird sightings. And if the people who took the pictures could just talk briefly about what's going on, that'd be great. That would be me. Okay. Um, so this um, first picture is a great crested flycatcher. Of course, I did not know what it was when I took the picture, but my expert leader, um, Steve Coggin, told me what I was taking a picture of. And this was during a walk at um, Lower McAlpine Creek Greenway the other day. Um, and um, the picture on the right is a great egret at um, McAlpine Creek Park getting ready to land on a turtle. <laughs> That's terrific. Thanks. I, I think, leave your microphone on. I think you're going to come back again in a minute. Okay, these are not great pictures, but these were great birds. This was in Kannapolis, North Carolina on this little reservoir called Lake Fisher. And on the same day, there were wood storks and roseate spoonbills in just a little creek that's left in this reservoir since it dried up some in the summer. So that was a, a really nice sighting. And I think the spoonbills are really interesting because we, we see them more and more and I think with climate change, we're gonna be seeing spoonbills a lot. Maybe they'll be nesting in Mecklenburg County soon. When, when was that, when did that happen? When did you see those birds? About a week and a half ago. And you didn't tell us? It was, Especially the storks. It was, uh, I read about it on the internet, so I thought everybody knew. No, need to tell us on met birds. Gotta use met birds more, don't, don't, don't rely just on eBird. To get the um, out. Do do we have wood storks for Mecklenburg County? No. Oh man. I don't yeah, think we do. So close. Yeah. yeah, yeah. A, few years, a few years back, there was a, a kind of a sickly bird at the golf course down near Central Avenue. A handful uh -huh. of us saw it. was a one day bird. A one day wonder. Yeah. Ah. Interesting. Okay. Who saw it? Uh, me, Taylor. David. Of course. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have a camera i got it while i was after work i didn't have a camera i don't think a picture taken actually i don't think anybody had a camera okay richard yes i go over to McAlpine creek park too and uh i saw this white sandpiper and didn't really quite know what it was and was lucky enough to get one shot with uh a normal colored solitary sandpiper behind it, which helped to identify it as a leukistic uh, solitary sandpiper. That was um, just before the big rain a week ago Wednesday, so the water was fairly low. And then I went over, we, Ann and I went over there again Sunday, and right near the end of, of our walking around, uh, this little Acadian flycatcher came and landed right in front of us. Hey, thank you. And now both of you. Well, I'll, I'll go first since I'm on, but uh, the, the red-shouldered hawk was actually in our front yard. Ann saw him when she came home from a walk and sat out there for the longest time. Uh, I don't know if he was checking out our chipmunks in the yard or what, but um, hopped from kind of tree to tree to tree. And I got quite a few good shots at different angles of him. Juvenile, I think. Really like the light in his eyes there. And the um, the osprey um, 
is also um, at the beaver pond of McAlpine Creek Park. And uh, he was having a busy little morning a few weeks ago um, fishing there. And um, it's, it's been one of my go-to places. I've, I've enjoyed going there and I've seen a lot of nice birds. Well, that's a tremendous photograph. Thank you. Okay, and Jeannie McCoy. Hi. Hello. Well, every bird I see in my yard is exotic. Um, but um, the yellow-throated warbler I saw on the trip to Edisto in June, and the rest are um, right here in Huntersville, um, the Eastern Wood Peewee um, was in July. And I just saw the chestnut-sided warbler um, this week, I think yesterday. And, and um, I, I'm not sure if you've got any more there. No, but, that's it. Okay, great. Um, oh, nice. um, I did see a Tennessee warbler the morning that I saw the chestnut sided warbler and didn't have my camera. Um, but every day is exciting. I think we need to have a, a bird walk at your yard. Oh, Judy, I would love that. <laughs> oh, all right. Oh, I You're would. On. I would. I mean, you all teach me. You know, <laughs> I, I've only been at this since the Bullock's Oriole. Yeah, since January. February. Came, came to the yard in December and left in March. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, you teach everybody who came has taught me a bird. And I, you would see it and then I would look for it and, um, and find it. So. I would love that. I wish you would plan one right here. Thank, well, thank you. Okay, you're on. Okay, I'd like to uh, welcome some new members who joined us of late. And I'm just going to run through the list real quick. And I apologize for anyone I missed, but Armand and Kay, Margaret and Gail, Kathy and James, Venetia and David, Sharon, Pat, Kim. Martha, Peggy, Suzanne and Jamie, Margaret and Mark, Linda and Susan. Welcome all, we're so glad to have you as members. And you'll be hearing soon, uh, those of you that are not new members, about renewing your membership. So be on the lookout for that. And it's a bargain, $10 per person or 15 for the whole family. Okay, now Richard Pocat, our Field trip coordinator is going to tell us about some upcoming bird walks and field trips. Yeah, we've uh, got uh, COVID guidelines in effect. Now that we're, you know, knowing more and more about this virus, we're finding that masking outdoors isn't as um, as an important a thing. So we're not requiring masking outdoors. We are asking people to do some distancing. Uh, we are um, keeping our size of our field trips to, to 12, and please register with the leader beforehand. Uh, we'll let that leader keep a wait list and contact people if there are openings. I think you have a list of some of the ones coming up. Yes. So... Yeah, this, this coming Saturday is uh, Ron Clark's, and that one is full. Um, Judy's going up to Clark's Creek in Chantilly. I was over at Chantilly today in the afternoon. It was kind of quiet over there in the afternoon. And uh, then there's the trip to, Jack, to uh, Jackson Park in Hendersonville on the 18th Saturday. Uh, Ron is leading another one at Six Mile Creek Greenway. And then um, last year, Ann and I went over to East Mech High School. We saw, I think Jeff Turner had posted that he had seen chimney swifts at East Mech at the incinerator chimney. And so we, we went over there, we ran into Janet and a friend of hers and really had quite a nice evening watching the chimney swifts. So 
we thought, well, it might be nice to go over there again. So I put that down on. And since there's only one species of bird to point out, um, which I think I can do, I'll, I'm going to be the leader for that one. We've also added um, that following Sunday, the 26th, for a swift night out. And uh, North Carolina Audubon is doing um, a swift night out that they're going to be doing as a simulcast on Wednesday, the 29th. And if there's enough interest, we, we might add that to the calendar as well. And then we've got Judy down for McDowell Creek Greenway and then a beginner walk with Marsha at uh, Atlanta Nature Preserve. Can I make a comment about the McDowell Creek? That's if you go out to the website, it actually has been changed. The location has been changed. It's actually going to be at uh, West. We're going to meet at Westmoreland um, Athletic Complex, which sounds so not birdie, but it is. Uh, the McDowell Creek uh, Greenway actually passes the back side of that. And I discovered that there's a whole bunch of trails between the football, the baseball fields and the um, and the actual greenway. And there's a, a, a much better mix of um, habitat. So there's some ponds, there's some fields, there's um, obviously some deeper woods, uh, there's cut throughs. Um, we may get all the way out to McDowell Creek Greenway or not, uh, but in general, um, I think it's going to be a better, uh, more um, varied habitat for us. So when you go out to the website, it's actually going to say um, Westmoreland Athletic Complex. And it's just, it's literally around, the, I don't want to say around the corner, but it's in that same area. It's right off of Catawba, uh, West Catawba, um, up in, um, I guess it's Cornelius. Uh, it's really easy to get to. It's actually easier to get to than the, the, uh, the Berkshire, um, the McDowell Creek. Um, so hopefully, um, don't be surprised with that. And the newsletter still has it as McDowell Creek, but the website has it as um, Westmoreland. I also just got an email from Ron Clark. Uh, everybody should have gotten it because it's on the, the Google Groups list. But he says two spots have opened up for next Saturday, first come, first served. Okay, well, thank you, Richard. Uh, a little business. We have birds and bean coffee available at www.birdsandbeans.com. And when you check out, type in M-A-S-N-I-C, and we get some financial benefit from that that we will use to benefit the farmers that grow these beans with the birds in Central America. Uh, we also have an international field trip going to Panama this coming June. We're going to be staying at the Canopy Lodge and Tower, and there are two spots left. So if you contact me, uh, get your deposit in, we will get you to Panama. And uh, the Canopy Tower is down here in the lower left picture. It's an old radar installation that was built by the U.S. military in the 60s to protect the Panama Canal. And now it's a lodge and bird watching site and you stand up on top of the tower in the canopy of the lowland rainforest in Panama. So that's uh, quite an exciting prospect. Wing Haven is about to celebrate their 50th anniversary early in November and registration is now open. And there are also volunteer opportunities available at Wing Haven. So if you're interested in doing that, please let us know and we can work that out. They, they're looking for people to lead bird walks in the garden at Wing Haven. And a little preview of our next meeting, uh, Tiffany Kirsten is uh, someone that Matthew Withrow, Withrow knows and she describes herself as a birding guide and sexual assault survivor. And she's going to talk to us via Zoom about Birdie Big Year, Elevating Women Birders. And now for our presentation, uh, our presenters are Gretchen Losey and Matthew Withrow. And Gretchen lives in Fort Mill, South Carolina with her husband, Tom Kamarski. She works for Collins Aerospace, headquartered in Charlotte and leads the Collins Tax Department. 
In addition to Mecklenburg Audubon, Gretsch is a member of the Carolina Bird Club and is the co-leader of the Ann Springs Close Greenway Birding Club. Matthew Withrow is a Charlotte, North Carolina native and serving his first term on the Mecklenburg Audubon Society Board as advocacy chair. An avid seabirder, Matthew has sought birds in the Arctic, Southern Pacific Oceans, in addition to nearly two dozen trips off the coast of South Carolina. And Gretchen and Matthew will now talk with us about pelagic birding. So um, good evening, everybody. Um, just make sure I've got this set up here correctly. I think so. Everybody can see the presentation. Looks good. Okay, good, good. <laughs> you never, you never know if you don't ask. There could be problems. Um, so uh, we're going to start out uh, kind of just talking generally about, um, you know, going out on a pelagic trip and and things to to know about when you do that. Um, I went out on my first trip um, about a month ago. And Matt, how many trips have you been on? Uh, more than you can count? <laughs> About 20, somewhere in there. And counting, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, and Jeff, I didn't think you were going to be here today, but uh, as you have comments and stuff, please uh, chip in and, uh, and, and add them uh, as you think of things. So, um, uh, so anyway, Jeff, how, many, how, how many has Jeff been on? That's what I want to know. Uh, I'm pushing about 70 off of North Carolina. Wow. So, give, or, give or take a few. Awesome. Yeah, you've lost count almost. <laughs> lost. Yeah. Um, so at any rate, uh, a, a lot of my comments, at least, will be from a, a newbie going out um, for the first time uh, on a plastic trip and some things that, you know, I guess I was a little surprised about or, or things that I thought might be helpful for folks to know. And then toward the end, um, uh, kind of focusing more on the birds and the common birds that you would likely see and, and how to uh, identify those birds. So um, that's the plan. Let's see if we can just forward. There we go. So um, as I mentioned, uh, I went out uh, a few weeks back, August 6th and 7th um, with uh, seabirding. That's Kate Sutherland and um, Brian Pattison's um, company. And um, there were... I, do you guys recall how many people, Matt, Matt and Jeff were on that same trip. How many people were on? Do you guys know? I think those were full. Um, so they, they had around 20, 20 guests and I guess four, three or four uh, guy, right. leaders, spotters. Yeah. Yeah. That seems, that seems about right. So it wasn't, it didn't feel crowded. But, um, you know, it felt, you know, reasonably full. Um, compared, and, to, mm -hmm. compared to, uh, uh, from, from what I've heard, I've never done a, a trip off the West Coast, um, but from what I've heard, those are much more crowded. And mm -hmm. so like when you get a good bird, everybody rushes and it's like three or four people deep on the, oh. on the side of the rail. Um, but this, yeah. this is a, the size of this boat compared to the number of people on it, so there's plenty of room and never really have to worry about, you know, squeezing people out of the way or elbowing people to, to get your yeah. bird. Yeah, everybody could easily fit along the edge, you know, if there were good birds along one side or the other. Definitely. Um, so one tip that I kind of learned the hard way uh, <laughs> is to definitely take Dramamine or uh, use a patch uh, before you go out. Um, I, I guess most people have those patches. I think Jeff, you had one. Matt, did you have a patch? No, you just- I'm lucky I don't get seasick. You don't get seasick? Ugh. I didn't think I did either. <laughs> but um, I learned that I do, <laughs> at least the first day. 
And I, I thought I had been taking Dramamine, uh, but it was natural Dramamine, which turned out to be ginger when I read the label more closely. <laughs> um, but then the next day I, I did have some 24 hour Dramamine. And I think Matt, you told me like a tip is to take it when you go to bed at night. And that worked out great because I slept really well and um, I felt great the whole next day. So um, just a tip if you are um, going to go out, <laughs> be uh, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. <laughs> um, so I guess another thing to know, which may be obvious to some, that you have to get up real early when you go out on a pelagic trip. Um, we met at 5.30 in the morning at the dock at um, uh, Hatteras uh, Landing. And, um, you know, we were there maybe more or less a half hour, I guess, before we actually took off. You have to do a sign-in and orientation and then folks um, get on the boat. And um, I guess another thing, I'm not sure if you can see it in this picture or not, but most folks had along a cooler, um, like usually a small cooler, because you're out there maybe 11 or 12 hours, which I guess I did not realize <laughs> the trip was that long. <laughs> uh it didn't really say on the website so I was just sort of winging it thinking we'd be home by two <laughs> uh any rate uh the second day I was smarter um but yeah you're out there all day and uh so most folks do bring a cooler and lots and lots of water and food because there is no food or water on the boat um so any rate but it's real pretty in the morning, as you can see um, with the, the picture there on the right. And then, um, and then um, I guess another thing I didn't realize um, is that it takes about two hours to get out to where you actually see birds. So you see birds when you're close to shore and you're in the harbor and you're, you're going out slowly. And that's kind of uh, this first picture. And it's real pretty. Um, but then after that, you're just sort of in open water for like two hours until you get to the continental shelf and the, um, the jet stream area. And so you're two hours out and you're two hours back. And so the second day I brought along some um, earbuds and listened to a book on tape for <laughs> a lot of that time because, you know, honestly, it, it's long. And, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's just something to, I guess, um, anticipate. Um, I guess the other thing I, I did, Sorry, Matt. I was, was going to say I I kind of had the same uh, same kind of reaction. I had no idea it was going to take forever to get out there the first time, and I remember we were, we were going and they're, they're hauling. You know, the boat's going pretty fast because they've got a lot of distance to cover. And I remember starting. You know, you see a couple of birds here and there uh, on the way out. And my first time, you know, I was really excited about seeing anything, and so we'd see something fly by and nobody would say anything or, you know, they certainly weren't stopping the boat. I was kind of bummed, but you know, I didn't, didn't I don't really wait, realize wait, that we were going, yeah, yeah, we got, but no, you see, you see plenty of them once you get out there. Yeah. The thing is though, is it's two hours out there from North Carolina, but it's the closest place on the East coast of the Gulf stream. So if you go out of Florida, you're talking a four to six hour trip to hit the Gulf Stream. If you go out of, say, New Jersey, I mean, those trips go out at like nine o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night, and you travel all night long and they start birding about sunrise. Mm. And so it's a different experience. I mean, it sounds two hours sounds long. It's really pretty short. <laughs> That's a good perspective, Jeff. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I was surprised how many people, as you were talking to different people, how many people are from all over the country. There were people from New York and Texas and, and all over. So yeah, people flock to. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's, a, 
here. It's the best place on the East Coast to get the diversity of seabirds that we get off of the East Coast. I mean, because we're the closest to the Gulf Stream, we can get the deep water quickly. We get to spend the most time in the water off of North Carolina. Um, you know, we don't get some of the northern species like white-faced storm petrel as often as they do up north. But besides that, you know, I mean, Brian picks up more rare birds than anywhere else along the East Coast anywhere. Yeah, yeah. So we're we're lucky to have it so relatively close to us. Well, while we've got this picture up too, uh, so the trips run pretty much year round. Uh, the one on the left, I think, is from a few weeks ago, uh, but the one on the right is from a trip in probably February or March. Um, those those trips are pretty different. They don't stay or they don't actually go out to the Gulf Stream. They stay closer to shore because uh, that's that's where all the birds are. And you see, you know, mirrors, razor bills, dove keys uh, out out along the shelf break. Uh, you get puffins, um, and there's, you know, I, at least my experience has been you get to see more non-bird sea life in the winter hmm. or at least i have so like you know whales dolphins uh different kinds of fish sharks stuff of that nature um and and you don't have that two hour haul out and back at the end of the beginning that's of the nice of the day. yeah but it is real cold so. <laughs> <laughs> that's pros and cons yeah yeah and i guess um the, the picture on the right there reminded me too that um, the other thing to make sure you bring along is rain gear, a good raincoat and rain pants, because even if it's the weather forecast says it's going to be clear, once you're that far out, uh, storms can pop up at any time. And, and um, the second day on our way back, we had a lot of rain. <laughs> Luckily, it didn't impact our birding at all. But um, you know, it can pop up and, and although you can get in that cabin, um, it's not that big and it gets really hot and kind of claustrophobic and cramped when, when a lot of people are trying to get in there to stay dry. So I think maybe half the people got in the cabin and probably the other half of the folks ended up spending the whole trip back outside. Um, So um, these are just a, a couple more pictures as we're, you know, kind of getting closer to the birds and you can, you can see uh, oftentimes it's just, you know, like one bird or two birds. You don't, at least the first day, we didn't really see any like big groups of birds. Um, the second day we did, and I don't know, Matt or Jeff, like what your impressions are as far as like, is it more normal to see, you know, just like a bird here or there versus big groups of birds when you're out? It varies a lot, but, you know, the, the time of year, the just any given weekend, uh, birds can be no, more numerous than others. Um, generally not going to be just like a steady, steady stream of like flock, huge flocks of birds out there, but you, know, you they uh, chum off the back of the boat so that you, they've got uh, fish oil dripping and and like these uh, frozen fish gut cakes that they put in this like giant suet feeder looking thing and drag behind the boat. And the uh, that's that's kind of what brings a lot of the birds in and um, the storm petrels in particular, they'll kind of start to congregate in and follow the boat. Sometimes you can have hundred storm petrels behind the boat and they'll just kind of follow us all day long. Um, and other times, you know, we do run into big flocks of birds that are, that are feeding on schools of fish. So, you know, we might run into a group of you know, hundred plus shear waters and turns and hmm. um, stuff like that. And then other days they just kind of trickle on by just so it's a crazy environment out there that's always changing. So you never really know what you're going to get. Yeah. Well, uh, and speaking about storm petrels, that's a good segue um, <laughs> into 
kind of uh, the discussion about about what do you see out there. So um, the Wilson storm petrel is by far, at least when we were out there, um, the most um, abundant of the, the different birds that we saw uh, on our trip. Um, and as I learned, there's kind of three families of, of birds that I had never seen before, um, the storm petrels, the petrels, and the shearwaters. So um, we'll, we'll kind of talk about um, each of those different ones that, you know, that you would normally see. Um, I, I really loved the Wilson storm petrel because they're just so darn cute. They kind of hop along, like you can see on the left side, they, they really look almost like they're kind of hopping with their feet and um, they, they have a really kind of fluttery butterfly-like um, flight. Um, and so they're just incredibly cute. And as, as Matt was saying, they like to follow the back of the boat and they will get fairly close. As you can see, these, these guys got, got pretty close to us because, you know, they're just eating and, and continuing to follow the boat around. Um, so any rate, um, I like those guys an awful lot. Uh, anything, I guess, about them? Um, not, uh, they, they have really cute sounds that they'll make too sometimes, mm. um, for Wilson storm petrels, but just on the note of, of birds getting close, uh, like that, uh, can you go back one slide actually? Um, so you see that picture on the left, you know, that bird may look distant in that photo, but that was taken with my five-year-old's base level iPhone. Uh, with no zoom at all on it. Like sometimes these birds will get so close to the boat that you can, you could almost reach out or sometimes literally reach out and touch them. Um, so it is a very, very cool experience to, to get that close to these, uh, these birds, which are often very large. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. So, um... The next one is the band rumped storm petrel. So this bird is really confusingly similar to the Wilson storm petrel. Um, they both have, you know, white rumps and, and they're dark and, you know, on first glance, they look almost exactly alike. <laughs> um, but there are some, some differences. Uh, and when you start looking at them longer, you, you it starts to, be more apparent. So one thing is that their legs don't go beyond their tail. And so if you look back um, here, you can see the um, in the right hand side, the legs are trailing behind the tail there, like very obviously they've got super long legs on the Wilsons versus the band rump, um, you know, you do not see the legs. So that's one kind of obvious difference if you're close enough to see that. <laughs> um, the other is uh, their wings are thinner and longer. And then probably the easiest thing to notice at a distance is just how they fly very differently. They, um, they don't flutter like the, the Wilsons. They kind of fly in arcs and long glides. And as you watch them, you can, you can pick them out, but it's easy to lose them and <laughs> if they're with a, a bunch of, of Wilson storm petrels. Yeah, for sure. These, these are a, a, a tough ID to make. Um, and to further complicate the issue, there are several other types of uh, storm petrels that are possible to get out there that also look pretty similar. Um, so leeches is probably the next most common and that looks very, very similar to this guy, but it's got a, like a forked tail and also a, a different flight style compared to either this or the, or the Wilson storm petrel. Um, you know, beyond that, uh, one that looks pretty similar, at least plumage wise is a uh, European storm petrel. Um, so before my first trip, I was looking through all these old eBird reports and, you know, I got my nice seabird, uh, field, field guide books, one of those older ones. And I was going through and I was trying to study these guys and memorize all the field marks and stuff. 
and you know, I got out there. I had no idea. <laughs> it is a really difficult task to learn all that stuff before, but you know, once you get out there, you, the leaders and spotters are, are really, really good at getting you on the birds. And then furthermore, you know, helping you uh, become a better birder by, by pointing out the field marks and, and getting you familiarized with the species uh, in a way that's very, very helpful. Yeah, definitely. Though I would say it, it is helpful to do your homework ahead of time too. So you at least know what to expect and, and what you're supposed to be seeing, even if you don't <laughs> really see it or, or recognize all those differences. Um, when they start pointing them out, it, it, it helps definitely. Um, so um, next one is the uh, black capped petrel. So there are a lot of confusingly similar, similar petrels. <laughs> um, this guy, uh, one of the, the key things to look for that makes him different from a number of other ones is the, um, the very obvious white rump. So his, his white um, on the upper tail there. Um, and obviously the black cap and um, kind of clean white below uh, with the black bar. Um, and we saw, I would say, uh, you know, a decent number of these, not, not a ton, but, you know, I don't know, how many would you say total we ended up seeing, Matt? Um, yeah, it really depends on the day. The black cap is, is one of the signature species uh, for, for these trips. Um, they, we see them, I've seen them on every trip I've taken outside of the winter time and usually in pretty, pretty good numbers, you know, in between 30 and 70, you know, this is probably the uh, expected range for how many, how many you're going to see. But just, just to give folks an idea of how special this bird is, there's probably only between two and 4,000 individuals left in the wilds. So this is a pretty highly endangered bird. Wow, um, I did not realize that. Yeah. It's, Especially because we saw it pretty frequently. It's hard to appreciate out, out there because you see so many of them and you know, so regularly uh, out of Hatteras. But, um, yeah, they're, uh, they're a special bird for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess the thing I didn't mention on the previous slide about the band rump storm petrel is we only saw a couple of them. We saw tons of the Wilsons, but we only saw, I don't know, a handful um, of the band rumped. And then the leeches, I think there was like somebody thought they saw one, maybe Kate saw one for a minute <laughs> at way on the back of the, the I think oil one of the slick. spotters got a quick photo of one and it, and it was gone. Yeah, I never saw it. So that the, the leeches was definitely not, um, at least not a very frequent one that time of year. And, it, and it's not always like that. Sometimes you go out and the Wilsons are almost always the, the more, the more common ones, but sometimes we'll go out and we'll see nothing but Wilsons and leeches and we'll have 15, 20 leeches and no band rumps. And then other times we none of either just see Wilson's <laughs> all day. So never know yeah. what you're going to get for sure. Yeah. Now, I don't know um, if you want to say anything or maybe Jeff might about um, like petrels and shearwaters and just kind of how, how they live. I mean, I guess I don't know enough about them individually. But my understanding is they they have huge ranges and, and all these seabirds can, you know, be in Europe or South America or some other place and, and show up off a of Hatteras. Yeah, they definitely range. I mean, a lot of the petrels, you know, will nest off the, the coast of Africa, you know, the Madeirian Islands over, um, you know, off of the, the west coast of Africa, and then they end up looping around, you know, Bermuda petrel, 
actually uh, is native to Bermuda. Um, it's coming from Bermuda and it's going along the East Coast all the way up into, you know, upper New England area. Um, you know, you've got some of these shear waters that nest up in the Northeast. You know, great shear water nests up in the Northeast. Um, leeches, storm petrel will, will nest up in the Northeast. Um, a lot of your, your, your winter birds, you know, the, the puff <clears throat> murs and, you know, the razor bills, those all nest up in the Northeast. Uh, band rump storm petrel is more of a Southern bird. You know, they're more coming out of the Gulf Coast. Like if you think it's a plaid ship out of the Gulf Coast, you're going to get band rump storm petrel, probably not so much of a leeches. If you go out of the North or the New England, you know, you might get, uh, you know, leeches, but not, not band rumped. Um, and then you, we always get these, these rare petrels, you know, Faya's petrel and Trindaddy petrel, you know, those are, those are probably nesting, uh, you know, closer towards England and, uh, you know, off the coast of Africa than they are to, uh, you know, to the U.S. Um, and then we also get some tropical species that are, are more like, you know, the, the Caribbean, the um, Bahamas areas, you know, brown booby is nesting down off of, you know, the southeast of, of Florida. You know, you get some the occasional brown knotty that comes up our way that's nesting down there. You get bridal tern, sooty tern that are more of a tropical species of tern that are, uh, you know, taking, you know, post breeding dispersion trips up our way. And then we get the occasional, you know, migrants moving through, you know, the Jaegers move through, uh, Arctic tern moves through, um, you know, some other birds are going from, you know, far south up to their breeding grounds up in the, the Arctic tundra, and then return back south again, you know, Sabin's gull, you know, they get in September, you know, frequently off of the, the coast, you know, also occasionally, you know, we, we get lucky and find Sabin's gull on Lake Norman uh, in September, which we're hoping for this this September again. Um, so it just kind of it just kind of varies. I mean, there's there's birds coming from all over. There's been you know lots of rare birds that have showed up from you know the, the South Atlantic uh, that, that you know occasionally come up as well. So you just never know. You never know what you're going to get out there. That's that's part of the, the excitement of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that that is pretty neat. How and and I think you guys both said this a number of times um, when we were out. Like you just, it's different every time you go out. You don't know what you're going to see, and and you know, just because you saw one thing one day, it doesn't mean that's what you're going to see the next. So um, so I think that's why a lot of people do go again and again and again because there's so many uh, the, the chance of seeing something new. Um, and we got lucky uh, on our second day out with the Trindade petrol, um, which I guess I, I don't have anything to compare it to, but my understanding was it was not one that you see that often. Yeah, they've got that. This is a, a dark morph individual, which I believe are the more common variety. Uh, just, just you might be able to correct me there, but. Uh, Right. Sooty, sooty Shearwater would be one of the kind of lookalikes that folks might get confused with the Trindades. Um, but yeah, they're good birds to see. Uh, certainly not one you get every time out there. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Corey Shearwater, um, we saw quite a few, uh, well, quite a few. We saw them uh, several times, I guess, um, um, the quarries. And um, this is the, the largest shearwater. Um, and, you know, as Matt was saying earlier, they do get pretty close to the boat. So, um, you know, it's quite impressive when they're flying by and, uh, and, and pretty close. Um, this one, uh, I believe was the Mediterranean scopolis, um, which has the, you can see the, the white on the inner webs of that one on the left. Um, and that was the more prevalent one we saw. Um, apparently that um, subspecies um, 
breeds in the Mediterranean and then for whatever reason uh, makes their way over to, to our waters. And then um, the third shearwater we saw was the great shearwater. Um, it um, is a little bit similar looking to the black capped petrel in that it you know, has a dark head and you see a little bit of white um, on the back rump, but uh, as you can see, it's a real thin line um, on the black, uh, on the back. <laughs> Um, and, and also, um, you know, it's, it's bill is different and, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the flight's a little bit different. So, um, but all of these birds are kind of confusingly similar when you're, when you're first out. And that's why folks like Jeff and Matt are <laughs> so helpful to have along. Um, yeah, they're all, yeah, they're they're all similar they've all got that like counter shading on them the with the dark on top and the and the white underneath and that's just essentially camouflage for them you know a, a predator from below is, mm -hmm. is going to see the lighter the light against the sky whereas a predator from above is is going to have a hard time seeing it uh against the dark darker ocean mm -hmm. yeah that makes a lot of sense um, and then the Audubon Shearwater is our smallest one, and they were awfully cute too. You can see how cute this guy is. I mean, he's kind of like looking at us as he's flying by, <laughs> and he also was really close. Um, so he's he's pretty distinctive just because he he's so small, and um, you know he flies close to the water, and um, you know. Uh, looks similar to the other ones, but is, is um, distinctive just because of his uh, kind of bill shape and, um, and head, dark head, et cetera. So the last one we had was the um, brown booby. He just was kind of a, a lucky flyby. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't know how often do we do you guys see like a booby go by, Matt? That's the only one I've seen. Really? Uh, I think they've had two brown boobies and one masked booby this year, all on all on different trips. Hmm. Yeah, it it varies from year to year. Some years they're very common. You know, they might get, you know, five to ten. Some years they might get one to two brown boobies. Mass boobies, probably less frequent. They're probably more like a July, August bird. And they get, you know, a handful of those. Occasionally you might get one in the May spring blitz as well. Hmm. You know, and those are tropical birds. Those are coming from, from the south. Yeah, and we did have a, a storm that came through like later that second day. So maybe that had something to do with, with blowing, blowing him in. Um, so that's the end of our slideshow. Um, I guess we should open it up to questions. If anybody has any questions about going on a pelagic trip or anything else? So a couple of questions on here. Uh, so one of them was, how, how often do you encounter bait balls in the water with birds and marine creatures feeding on them? Um, so I think I know what you're talking about. Uh, I've seen these in a lot of nature documentaries where you have the, the kind of get the cameras underwater and see these huge uh, balls of fish and they're getting harassed by the tuna and the dolphins and the, the, the birds from above. Um, so I can't really tell what's going on under the water to, you know, at least not a full picture when, when you're up there, but, uh, I think the fall is, is best for, um, for getting these, these big feeding flocks of birds. Um, and, you know, I, at least my, my last two trips and, and, 
Jeff, Jeff, I'm sure has more experience in this in this department, but um, yeah, just for the rest of the year, it's kind of hit or miss. Sometimes you, you get a get a big flock, and other times you don't. Uh, but uh, let's see, red-footed or blue-footed boobies? I don't think we have blue-footed for North Carolina. I don't. I don't think we have one of those yet. We have exactly one red-footed booby, which was actually not seen on this trip. This was uh, our our only red-footed booby was photographed by somebody on a cruise ship outside of Wilmington. Um, so we're we're waiting for our first. Um, we don't have it. Don't have it quite yet. Jeff, when's the best time for tropic birds? Yeah, probably May. There are probably more tropical birds seen in May than most months. I mean, you can get red-billed and white-tailed in May. I mean, I've had both both birds on the same trip a handful of times. Um, you know, we had a white-tailed tropic bird um, on the weekend that the mass trip was scheduled. Um, but they're probably more frequent in the May, June. But you know, you know, they're 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 fairly random birds. You know, sometimes those birds are seen out in the deep when there's nothing else around. All of a sudden, you'll have a white, you know, a tropic bird drop down over the boat. Um, it's it's kind of hit and miss on tropic birds. And they are they are funny. They'll you'll be going along, and a lot of times it'll be at least in my experience been kind of a slow stretch in the afternoon, and then just out of nowhere, somebody will yell "tropic bird," and it'll be ten feet away, right on top of the boat. Every time, every time yeah. it's, it's like they drop in right on top of the boat. Sometimes you get them by seeing the shadow and you see the shadow on the deck and you look, there's a tropic bird and it's like, they're always like right there, you know, and then they, they fly around a couple of times and then they, they fly off and, and then they're gone. And then, you know, they're, they're a deep water bird most of the time, you know, and they're, they're fairly solitary birds. You know, occasionally, you know, like I say, I've seen a couple of tropic birds you know, together a couple of times, but most of the time not. Most of the time it's just one or the other, you know, out there by itself. You know, we had one on the, the second trip on that Sunday uh, when um, Kirsten, Tiff Tiffany Kirsten was on, and um, that was the last bird of the, the day. Like, we were getting ready to head in, and we had a tropic bird, and as soon as the tropic bird left, you know, he put it into gear, and we went home. You know, that's, that's, that's kind of the way it goes some days. There's a question in the chat about albatrosses out there. Any experience with those? Yeah, most albatrosses are, are winter birds. Um, February there are most of the reports of albatross. There's been yellow nose and black browed albatross in February. There have there have been a handful of reports from um, Cape Hatteras. You know, Kevin Metcalf from Mecklenburg County is one of the few that had a, a yellow nose albatross fly right over his head on the, the uh, Hatter's Point. I know years before that, there was a yellow nose albatross that was photographed sitting on the beach from Cape Hatteras. And that was probably a May bird, I think also. Um, but most of the ones seen off of the boat have, have been in the winter, primarily in February. Hey, thanks. About how many birds do you see on average, not just the unique ones, but overall? So, species or individuals? Species. Species. Well, both. <laughs> I know the numbers can and can vary a lot, but the average kind of species. Uh, eight to thirteen species of birds, probably. It depends on the ship. Depends on how many shear waters you get tropical turns you get, um, if you get a rare petrel or not. Um, you know, number wise, you know, many hundreds of birds, you know, cause I mean, you can get several hundred, you know, Wilson storm petrels. I mean, the, the, one of the trips that I was on in August, you know, we had 150, 200 black cap petrels. You know, we had a couple hundred Cory shearwaters, you know, we had a handful of 
great shearwaters, a handful of Audubon shearwaters, um, you know, some flocks of terns. If you get into flocks of terns, you know, you might get five or 10 terns flying around together. Um, and then the winter is different. So the winter trips and the summer trips are totally different because, because the winter trips, they, they chum behind the boat the whole trip and you, you drag gulls with you from right after leaving, you know, Hatters, or Hatters Inlet. And so you'll get herring gulls and, and greater blackback gulls and lesser blackback gulls, you know, fall on the boat most of the day. And then you'll get, um, you know, larger numbers that come in and lower numbers that come in. And then you get other birds to come in to check out what's going on with all these gulls behind the boat. They're thinking there's food. And so you'll get the occasional great skua that comes in. You'll get the occasional manx shearwater that comes in, occasional great shearwater in the winter that comes in. And then you'll get, you know, the occasional rare gulls that come in. And we get Iceland gulls that come in behind the, go the boat. Occasionally get a Glaucus gull come in. Occasionally get a California gull come in. Yep, um, foul ropes too. Foul ropes. A lot of times you'll get into weed lines and you'll see, you'll see foul ropes gather around a weed line. Um, they really like, um, you know, that vegetation line there where they can feed on. Um, and then the winter chips, like they said before, you know, a lot of times you're more likely to get some of the marine life. You know, you're more likely to get humpback whales. You know, the number of dolphins seem to go up. You get Mantegis, Port Portuguese manta wars. Uh, you'll get some other whale sharks. Uh, you get turtles. You get a lot more turtles in the winter. A lot of loggerhead turtles in the winter. Uh, occasional leatherback turtle in the winter. Um, some other, you know, things that come in. And then you get obviously some different winter species that come in, like uh, the puffins and the, the dove key and the razor bills, the occasional common myrrh um, that you, you're not going to see in the summer. So, you know, it's uh, it's definitely a totally different mix in the winter as, as you get in the summer. You know, and there's still some variation in the summer between the spring and the fall. Um, you're more likely to get some of these rare, crazy rare birds in August. You know, there's been boars petrol showing up in August. There's been swin hose petrol showing up in August. Um, but then, in, you know, in May, you know, they've had Tahiti petrol. They had a uh, wedge rump storm, wedge rump shear water this last year. And that was a May, that was a May bird. Matt got that bird. Um, I, I'm envious of that bird. I missed that one. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's different. It's different every time. And that's why, you know, if you go out there and you get the opportunity to go out, you know, it's always a good idea to take multiple trips if you can do it and, you know, take two days, three days in a row instead of just taking one because you're always going to get something different. It's just it's always the way it works. So don't, you know, I'm sure Jeff has too seen a lot of real disappointed people who come, come a long ways uh, for a weekend in the Outer Banks and they, they only have one, one day, one shot to go out. If it's, if it's rough we'll cancel the trip and be out of luck and be really jealous of the people there who are, will already have spots on the next day's trip. Yeah. Well, you guys have, uh, uh, made me want to go out in February and May too. <laughs> I'll see you out there. Definitely good trips. And the people are, you run into so many great people out there. That's, that's half the, half the fun for me, you know, talk about, you know, it sounds like oh, two hours out there, two hours back, but you know, those two hours out there, everyone is like really, really excited. Uh, and so you're getting to know all these people and, you know, hearing about what everyone's speculating about what crazy bird is going to come in and, um, just a real, real good social, uh, uh, social outing in addition to the cool birds that you can see. Jeff Turner asks, since uh, Kate says, Kate's, uh, he says, for some background, isn't Kate a biologist? And of course, Kate is the woman who uh, did our April uh, meeting. And it says, um, and they release uh, rehabilitated uh, birds and turtles. 
Is that true? That's true, yes. Yeah, so Kate's finishing up her, her, um, her degree from Wilmington. Uh, I forget the, the name of the college, but she's studying out of Wilmington. Um, you know, Wilmington, probably. Probably, yeah. And she's uh, got a great uh, marine biology department yeah. there. Yeah, that's what she's doing. She's doing marine biology. And you know, she's getting her master's right now. Offshore. Yeah, I mean, she is, um, Kate's incredible. Brian's incredible. I mean, they, they really know their marine life. Okay, more questions. Okay, well, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Matthew and Gretchen and Jeff for uh, this tremendous talk. And like Gretchen said, I think you've inspired us all to get out there on the boat at whatever season we can make it. Yeah, I was, I was real bummed, uh, real bummed our, our trip got canceled this year. We'll have to uh, get another one scheduled for, for next season. Uh, I think that would be really fun to get, get all the local folks out together. So. Yeah, lots of fun. And you know, some of y'all may know I take I take some the boat out off of Lake Norman semi regular. Um, I'm always open to taking new people, so you know if you're interested in going out, you know let me know. Um, we're doing running several trips in September, hoping to get Sabin's Gull and migrating terns. We're gonna get one on Saturday. We hope so. Yeah. <laughs> right date. Okay, and if you know someone who wasn't able to attend tonight, you can let them know that we've recorded this and it'll be up on the website, right, Judy? Yes, I'll have it up tomorrow. Okay. And our next meeting will be October 7th and it'll be Tiffany Kirsten who will present Birdie Big Year Elevating Women Birders. Okay. We'll take a few minutes to socialize, but otherwise, I think the meeting's about done. So it's good to see everyone, talk to some of you. Hope to see you in the field soon. Be out there. Lots of, 